Hello. Seems to work.
Am I muted? I'm not muted. Okay, welcome everybody. This is a huge audience here. Um, you can probably bring it in on the screen so people online don't see how big the audience is. Um, welcome to our program today in, hu in Whom We Trust. The speaker is Michael Diana. Uh, he's been here before. Uh, he's native of the Capital Region, a longtime student of local history, studied history at Hamilton College with a focus on European colonial history. He's been with the Schenectady County Historical Society for five years, five years plus, I guess, by now. Well, yeah, that's, that's outdated. I've been with them for, geez, closer to seven years now. Oh, okay. Well, I'll have to update this. I have to update that. <laughs> this is true. That's where I got it from. <laughs> and he's currently the Director of Education and Historian at the Schenectady County Historical Society. For those of you online, obviously you're either watching it live or you're on a recording. This recording will be available for a while. There will be questions at the end um, for however you like to get them. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, guys, if you ever want to email me a question, you can either do it through Leo or you know, feel free to pass out my contact information. Um, if I get flooded with requests, I might have to revise that policy, but uh, I'm not too worried about that. So it's nice to meet you all. Again, I am Mike Diana, uh, Director of Education at the Schenectady County Historical Society. So the presentation today, In Whom We Trust, boy, this one takes me back. I gotta be honest, this one, this was an exhibit that we put together actually even before I worked at the Historical Society, like full time, formally. This was actually me as just a, just a guy, an artist in the capital region, an artist, uh, working with the Historical Society uh, to put on uh, an exhibit. We got a, a grant from the state to do it. It was a, a whole thing. And that was back in the distant, distant year of 2016. So yeah, this, this project is pretty darn old. But I think the lessons that we can learn here are still pretty uh, timeless. They still hold true. And what this was, it was an exploration of different faith groups in our local area. Uh, in particular, different faith groups that maybe people wouldn't have heard so much of before. Uh, of course, everyone kind of knows what happens in a Christian church, right? Uh, pretty much everyone has been to a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah once in their life. They kind of are familiar with go what goes on in the synagogue. But I was hoping to, to highlight some other communities that might not be so well represented in popular media. So we'll get to that in just a little bit. But first I want to talk about a question. What is a religion anyway? What is a religious group? And here we are in this venue we have to have at least someone who knows the answer, right? What's going on here? I mean, it's the kind of question which is so easy and so in your face, it actually becomes difficult, right? Does anyone have a definition they want to throw out here? There's no wrong answers. It's just my answers are better, whatever. <laughs> Nothing? Fair enough. We'll turn to Merriam-Webster then. At least Merriam-Webster in 2016 said, <clears throat> a religion is a belief in one or a group of gods. That's a very simple parsimonious definition, right? That, that's, that's easy to remember, at least. Or how about, this is their second definition, an organized set of beliefs, ceremonies, and rules used to worship a god or a group of gods. Now, now, these definitions, they're not wrong necessarily, but something about them to me just doesn't really seem to capture everything that goes into what I think a religious group would be. Or, or rather, it doesn't, it doesn't hold true for a, a group of individuals. This might make perfect sense for one person, but for a group of individuals, right? Because we have these religious groups, these great faiths of the world or smaller, more kind of niche uh, religious practices. You know, we have these faith groups. Um, if a religion is a belief in the supernatural, wouldn't that imply that a religious group would all believe kind of the same thing about the supernatural? Does that, does that follow for you guys? Am I making a non sequitur here? But here's the thing. I mean, this is kind of a religious group, right? This Uniform Church, right? I'm, not, I'm, I'm in the right place, right? Fantastic. Okay, I thought I was lost here. Uh, do you guys think that everyone here believes the same thing about God or the afterlife or the, the cosmos? I highly doubt 
that's the case. And I don't think you guys are like weird to not be in perfect unanimity here. Honestly, I think that no matter which group you're looking at, uh, either through time or across space or maybe both, or even one specific group highly localized to this spot in Niski Una, New York, I think every religious group is going to contain a, a large degree of diversity. Diversity in belief, diversity in background, diversity. So when we're looking at what a religious group might be, Personally, the whole aspect to what people believe, that doesn't answer the full question for me. Instead, I would argue that there's much more of a social component to what a religious group is. I'd like you to consider religion not as a relationship with God or gods, but as a relationship with our fellow human beings. That is to say, there is a social aspect, a secular aspect to religious practice, which we can very easily observe here and now, throughout history, any place and time that you're looking, you can find people interacting with each other in these kind of religious media. Um, and that's something that we can observe, right? We can leave these kind of cosmological, metaphysical questions aside. We can observe this kind of stuff in the here and now. We can document it, we can take pictures of it, we can participate in it as well. So again, imagine, consider that a religious group doesn't really have as much to do with what you believe, but perhaps in whom you believe or in whom you trust, which is where kind of the, the title of this presentation comes from. Now, with that in mind, I would like to introduce you to certain religious groups in our community. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this central organizing thesis that religion is a, well, it's a, it's a set of social interactions. And we're going to look at how these social interactions, how there's patterns across these groups, which at least on the surface would be completely different from each other, right? They're completely different traditions originating in completely different parts of the world, and yet they all seem to sort of evolve in a parallel fashion to the same sorts of practices, of social practices, which are intensely intertwined with any of the cosmological, the theological stuff that's also going on. So that's what I'm trying to, to, to highlight here today. Uh, one of our first groups that we'll be talking about, I just, you know, I, I chose four. Remember, this was just me with a camera back in 2016. I don't want you to think that this is a comprehensive and exhaustive search of every single different religious group in the capital region or in Schenectady County in particular. Um, I visited four. I did the best that I could within the confines of the grant period that I had to work with. I had another job at the time. So again, you know, this is just a, a, a snapshot, a sneak peek into maybe some communities that you haven't visited before. If you guys want to know more about these folks, you know, I can tell you only the very basics today. I highly encourage you guys to go out to these communities yourself. They're perfectly welcoming. At least they, they welcomed me in, right? And I'm just a guy with a camera, right? I, it was probably pretty weird, me showing up. Hi, guys, can I take pictures? They were, they were pretty chill about it. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to the Hindu Temple Society of the Capital District. Uh, these folks are out on Albany Shaker Road, out kind of towards, uh, I think, technically it's in Loudonville, but I always associate it with Colony. You've got to drive through Colony to get there. Afram Sports Complex is over there. Anyway, so the Hindu Temple Society of the Capital District. Of course, this would be a representation of the Hindu faith. If you guys have never heard of Hinduism before, well, here's some basics. Uh, it's a diverse set of religious beliefs and practices native to the Indian subcontinent. And when I say diverse, folks, I really do mean diverse. I mean, this can hold true for all of the groups that we're talking about, but honestly, Hinduism, with all that it encapsulates, with all those 1.35 billion people who identify themselves as Hindus, if you go to different parts of the Indian subcontinent, I think Hinduism is going to look wildly different from the other parts, uh, like what people are actually physically doing. I think you can have some, some great disparities or, or, or differences between different communities, different townships, all identifying as Hindu, but doing things that are completely different from their fellow Hindus elsewhere. And I imagine that the same holds true, right, from uh, the, the Hindus who make their way to America and they kind of have their own community here, I suspect there's quite a bit of difference between what's going on here versus what's going on back in India or other parts of the Hindu diaspora around the world. Um, Hinduism is kind of seemingly polytheistic, right? There's a lot of different gods uh, in the religion that you might pray to, that there might be statues of, idols to. Uh, that being said, at least the Hindus that I've talked to, uh, 
that polytheism is really just kind of a veneer. Uh, it's just kind of what it appears on the surface. Uh, when really different Hindus will have kind of an, an overarching deity, an overarching god, which the other gods are just an aspect of. Uh, I think the, the two most, you know, principal deities in the Hindu tradition as it's practiced, uh, one is Vishnu, right? A lot of Hindus identify not just as Hindus, but Vaishnavites, which is to say Vishnu is the principal deity. All other deities in the pantheon are actually just representations of Vishnu. Does that make any sense? Is that right? Uh, similar thing, there's also, I think, a, a smaller subset of the Hindu population uh, have a similar thing, but instead for, for Shiva, the god Shiva is the principal deity, and all other deities are just aspects or manifestations of Shiva. So there's some diversity right there. Now, for our purposes here, the Hindu Temple Society, the one that I visited, uh, formed here in 1976. It's a relatively recent addition to the kind of the, the social fabric of our area. You could probably imagine back in 1661, 1700, whatever, 1800, there weren't a whole lot of Hindu folks coming to Schenectady for a variety of reasons. In the more recent past, the latter half of the 20th century is where you have enough to really form a community together. And although I, I kind of focused on the Hindu Temple Society, which is over, actually technically outside of Schenectady County, right? It's, it's in Albany County. Um, I would have really loved to get involved with, or get access to, there's um, other Hindu temples in Schenectady which are associated with the, uh, the Guyanese population, right? The most, the most recent large block of immigrants to our county, the, the Guyanese population, uh, I do believe most of them, all of them, are, are Hindu themselves. And they have a whole different uh, kind of, well, they have their own uh, temples, which I imagine might look and might kind of run quite a bit different than the, the Hindu temple of Albany, because, well, they're from Guyana, which is, you know, not the Indian subcontinent. They've been transplanted there a while back, and now they're retransplanted here, so I imagine that would look and feel quite a bit different as well. So Hinduism, we'll be looking at Hinduism over the course of this presentation. I also visited the Islamic Community Center of the Capital District, and that is a mosque, an Islamic Community Center, uh, located in Schenectady County. It's kind of right off of uh, State Street there. It's, it's pretty close, uh, I guess you might say. Ah, oh, geez, what's over that way? Well, it's on uh, Upper State Street before you, before you leave Schenectady County. It's, it's over there. Um, and Islam, if you, if you haven't heard, uh, Islam is an iteration of the Abrahamic tradition, which is to say it's ostensibly worshiping the same God that Christians worship, that Jews worship. It's the same figure that Abraham first uh, tried to sacrifice his son to way back in the day, right? It's the same guy. Um, however, they focus on the teachings of the prophet Muhammad, uh, who lived in the late 6th century, right? So, you know, it, it's kind of interesting, right? I, I, was, I, I just feel like I should bring this up, that... Islam is treated as this completely separate, different thing to Christianity or Judaism. But they're really all like referencing the same prophets. It's just that they have different kind of focuses on this tradition. They're all worshiping the same God. At least they would admit to it, right? They're all worshiping the same God, maybe in different ways. Um, but it's just interesting because when I was talking to some of these folks all the way back in 2016, I, I met a man named Ibrahim good name. Uh, he was from Syria, and the way that he described Islam to me is that, you know, in, when Muhammad was, you know, when he uh, received the message from God, ostensibly, uh, the, the practice of Abrahamic religion had really kind of corroded and been corrupted, and the, they had lost the essence of it, and really all that Muhammad did was really just kind of bring the Abrahamic tradition back to what it was supposed to be originally, right? Kind of revive the, the, the essence of what God wanted uh, his followers to do. And honestly, to me, what, is, what does that sound like to you? It sounds a lot like Protestantism to me, but, you know, I guess a lot of people don't see it that way. It's this whole other tradition. And of course, I mean, I did this project in 2016, right? And Islam was always the big bad boogeyman of the 2000s and the 2010s, right? For a variety of reasons, the, the whole country uh, kind of had this, you might say, Islamophobia. And I, and I encountered this, I mean, not directed at me, of course, but in my interactions with these folks here at the Islamic Community Center, they were a lot more wary of me than the other folks were, perhaps with, with good reason. I'm just some white guy with a camera. Hi, guys, can I investigate what you're doing here at the Islamic Community Center? Trust me, I'm, I'm here as a, as a scholar. I mean, they were probably a little bit like, what's this guy doing? What's, what's he up to? 
because they had probably, you know, gotten a lot of static in the post 9-11 world. Uh, it was pretty difficult to be Muslim in, in, in America for a, a couple of reasons, right? Now, for our purposes, the Islamic Community Center of the Capital District, it was founded in the 1960s and 70s. Personally, I'm not aware of too many other mosques that would have existed in our area before that. I'd have to do more research upon that. But again, that's not maybe the, the focus of this presentation. I also visited the Sikh temple, Guru Nanak Darbar. You guys familiar with that? I drove by here to get here. It's on the same road. It's just a couple miles that way. You guys ever been to there? And you guys ever visited? You should check it out. It's pretty cool. I think they, the building that they occupy used to be some kind of Christian church. I think it used to have a, a history as a Christian church. Methodists? Okay, Methodist church. Well, they occupied it, or they purchased it, rather. That's, that's what they did in 2010. Um, now, Sikhism, if you're not familiar with the Sikh religion, uh, that also traces its roots back to modern-day India, or the Punjab region of India, which is kind of sandwiched between the modern states of Pakistan and India. It's this kind of geographic region that has long had some historic significance, and that's where Sikhism would come from. Sikhs, who today number somewhere between 30 and 35 million, at least on the subcontinent, had always kind of served as this largest third party, right? The Indian subcontinent was long divided between Hindus and Muslims. They often didn't get along, and the Sikhs were often caught in the middle of all this kind of political and religious controversies that were happening throughout, you know, the, the, the historical period. Um, the religion itself developed in the, 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 the 15th century, so that's relatively recent, right? This, this kind of whole new tradition developing uh, sandwiched between uh, powerful uh, Hindu groups and powerful Muslim groups that often didn't really like what the Sikhs were up to, because they had this whole other kind of um, idea about God and the gods and what, how, what, how you should uh, behave. So Sikhs were often persecuted by whoever was in power in their area. It's a, it's a long, long story. Um, they had ten successive gurus, the first being Guru Nanak, um, and the last being the holy book. Uh, the eleventh guru, I should say, uh, is not actually a living person, but it, it's the holy book, the Granth Sahib, which for them serves as the eternal living teacher. Not a person, but a book, and you can always kind of consult that for, for wisdom, right? Uh, now, again, this, this particular church, uh, sorry, the, the Darbar, I guess is what they would call it, uh, serves about 100 families in our area and was founded in 2010. Personally, I am not familiar with any other Sikhs or large Sikh organizations uh, in Schenectady or Capital Region uh, history uh, prior to this one. I could be wrong. This is just all that I know. And then finally, I visited the Unitarian Universalist Society of Schenectady. Now, these folks, they got a cool building over there on Wendell Avenue over there in the GE Realty plot. Now, Unitarian Universalism, now that's, that, that's a pretty interesting kind of group. It's, I almost would struggle to even call it a, a religion per se. It's very non-dogmatic, right? They don't have any central creed. There's no pope of universal Unitarianism. You know, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no college of cardinals. Uh, but they describe themselves as a group of truth seekers. Uh, searching for universal truths. They draw upon wisdoms, insights, teachings from various different traditions. At least they, they try to, right, in their, in their services. Um, Schenectady has at least, well, this particular group of Unitarians trace their history in Schenectady back to 1901, but you can find Unitarian is, Unitarians and Universalists in Schenectady even prior to that. I mean, these, these two traditions merged in the 1960s, I want to say the 1960s, to become Universal Unitarianism. But the current structure was built in 1961, that, that place in, uh, uh, on Wendell Avenue. Now, to be honest, you know, uh, I, I say that the, the UU Society kind of draws on various traditions, but between you and me, folks, the people there seem to me to largely be kind of just like white people who perhaps, you know, the, the traditional structures of the Chris Christian church were a little bit too stuffy for them, so they decided to, you know, come to, to something a little bit more, I guess, liberal or open or whatever you want to describe it as. It's not like I personally witnessed folks from all around the world, a United Nations of, of different peoples represented here. But nevertheless, that's, that's not the point. So those are the groups that we looked at, right? Those are the groups that I looked at. I went with my camera. I met various people who kind of served as my envoys to their particular community. Uh, they were very gracious in opening their buildings to me. A lot of them gave me food. That was pretty cool. Um, 
and I identified certain themes which I found remarkably consistent throughout. And these are just four themes that I could capture with a camera, right? That's kind of a limiting factor of, of, of this presentation is, you know, I saw other things which maybe I just couldn't get good pictures of, you know? Uh, especially when you're, when you're working in, a, in, an, in an active religious place and people are having an actual ceremony, you don't want me just kind of like, you know, walking in here with the camera, excuse me, can you, can you do that one more time? I didn't get it. Can you light the holy fire one more time? Thank you. Uh, I didn't want to be that guy, right? So. Uh, so the first theme that I'd like to identify is the community aspect to prayer, this kind of social fulfillment that the act of praying can, can achieve. And, uh, uh, you know, attachment to our fellow human beings, that's, you know, that's like, I don't know where that is in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it's up there, right? People need to feel like they're part of a larger group. Humans are social animals. If we weren't social, we wouldn't be fully human. And all these different religions actively incorporate this communal spirit into their religious practice. So whatever's going on with the metaphysics or the theology, these more kind of observable, secular aspects of everyone coming together, well, well, that much we can, we can see with our own eyes. Now, this is uh, Charmaine Azur. And she was, uh, well, she was uh, kind of my envoy to the, to the Muslim community. Actually, she didn't actually go to the Islamic Center. She was a Union College student. So I don't know if she spent too much time at the Islamic Center, but she was the one that I got a chance to speak with the most. She's, you know, young college kid in 2016. She was very eager to hear about my project. She was very eager to share her, uh, her experience with her faith with me. So I got to talk to her more than anyone else from the, uh, from the Muslim community in this particular project, right? And, and she was great. And, and this quote, from my interview with her, from my, my speaking with her, it really stuck with me. My faith cultivates my empathy for other people and my ability to connect with them. So that's what she said to me, and you can, you can hopefully see that on display in the next series of images. So here, this is from the, the Hindu temple. And you can see, again, the, the deep focus, the deep concentration of this guy, which you can't see, is right behind him, a line of other folks. I guess I failed with my camera there. I should have gotten more people into this, this frame here. But again, that kind of, that, that deep concentration and that deep focus, everyone doing it together. And you could, you could imagine the kind of sense of community that that builds. Next up. Here's the, from the Sikh Dabar. Here are a group of gentlemen. Uh, these are, you know, they're, they're, they're singing in this picture. They're, they're singing. I don't know what they're saying. They speak Punjabi, which I do not speak. And you can see behind them other gentlemen. Uh, this particular uh, uh, group, and I think most Sikhs in general, they have their services segregated by sex, but not in the, f the sense that the men are in front of the women. They're actually just side by side. So men go to one side, women go to the other side. If you're wondering why well, there's no women in the background, it's because they would be, well, they'd be right over here, but I just couldn't get them from the angle that I was at. You might also be wondering, it seems kind of interesting they got these, uh, these cool scimitars, right? Man, why, does, why doesn't, don't more churches want to incorporate scimitars into their service? I bet more people would show up if they had swords. Um, and a lot of people might be intimidated by that, like a lot of people who don't know much about the world, if they walked into a, a room that looked like this with these guys holding the swords, they might be like, ah, oh, what the heck's going on here? It's, it's totally harmless, folks. They're not here to use these swords on anyone. The symbolism of the sword has a long resonance in the Sikh community, again, being a, a, a smaller religious group, often persecuted by larger religious groups, the, the ability to defend the community, the Khalsa, as they called it, was, was often held very important. And you can actually see, this is kind of an article of faith for Sikhs, is, uh, you see these little knives down here? I forget what they call it. There's a Punjabi word for it, but they have to have these knives on them all the time, just on the off chance that they have to defend the community from anyone. Now, these folks don't feel like they actually have to, you know, whip these things out and use them. They're just, again, used in kind of the liturgy of what's going on. But again, you can see them all dressed more or less the same, all doing the same thing, and the, the bonding experience that that must be. So hopefully that comes through in the photo. Next up. Ah, so this was at the, the Islamic Community Center. And this image, I, I just thought it was very, 
interesting. Because, of course, when you go into the mosque, when you go into the prayer space within the mosque, they don't want you bringing your shoes in, right? They don't want you to walk all over the floor, the mats on the floor, and track the dirt in. You know, there's practical reasons for that, but there's also kind of, you know, religious reasons for that as well, you know. So they, everyone leaves their shoes out by the front door. And I just thought there was something kind of, well, communal about that, right? Everyone, doesn't matter where you are in your walks of life, you could be rich, you could be rocking the finest Air Jordans, you could be rocking the, the crappy sandals that I wear, you know, in my daily life, and everyone puts their shoes right next to each other, right there on the rack outside. Everyone kind of starts off on an equal footing, quite literally, when they go in to pray. And I think, you know, that's, that's a big aspect for, for these folks is that they, they feel very much, you know, that community when they go in to pray. And then finally, this is from the, uh, this is from the Unitarian Society. Everyone would, would be coming up to this central chalice of sorts, this, this sand pit, lighting candles and sticking them there into the sand, and everyone would just kind of come up one after the other to light these candles. Uh, again, because of the, the nature of the Unitarian Society, there's no, you know, I don't know exactly where they were pulling this ritual from. I mean, fire is obviously a, a huge symbol and a hu of huge significance in a lot of different human and religious traditions. Uh, but this particular candle lighting ceremony, to me, kind of evoked that same community spirit that I was hoping to, uh, to see. So that's that image. Which leads me to my next theme, culture. That religion and culture can be so intertwined, especially for communities, immigrant communities coming to a, a new country, a new place where people don't necessarily look like them, speak like them, you know, kind of have the same uh, symbols of reference as them. And I could imagine how the, the, the practice of traditional culture intertwined with the practice of religion would also be a major component for a lot of folks uh, at these communities, right? And, and maybe this will kind of bring this into focus if I showed you this quote right here. Now this is a kid named Aditya Srinivasan. I, I'm probably mispronouncing that. I, I, this was back in 2016. His mother, Sudharsana Srinivasan, uh, she was one of my envoys to the Hindu community. She lived here in Niskiyuna, so she was a local resident, uh, but rather than going to kind of the, the more local churches, which are Guyanese, she went to the one in Loudonville. Um, and she was a traditional uh, Indian dance instructor. Um, and she also, she didn't teach her son the drum, but it was very important to her, and I think it became important to her son, to learn in tr traditional Indian dancing. Now when I say traditional Indian dancing, that's probably like the most bland and generic thing that I could say. There's a very specific tradition that Aditya here uh, was learning to play, right? India is a big place, a lot of history. I don't know which particular school of drumming he was a student of. But this kid was good. I mean, you can't hear him from the photo. This kid was good. I, I had the, the, the pleasure, this was within their own home. You know, Sudharsana invited me to their home. She introduced me to her son, Aditya. And what he had to say is, if you have nothing and have lost all hope, you still have your heritage to be proud of and your God, regardless of what religion to turn to. Aditya would use his drumming in a lot of the ceremonies at the Hindu community center, either uh, explicitly religious services, but also just kind of more cultural ones, just kind of like, you know, fun little events of music and dancing Aditya would play. And, and this kid, gosh, he was still in high school. He was good. He was really, really good. But this would be one of his mom's students. So Sudharsana, is, that's not Sudharsana, that's not his mom. Uh, this was a student whose name I never knew, uh, practicing traditional Indian dance. Again, that's a very vague and generic term. There's a very specific tradition that she's practicing. I, I've forgotten that over the last seven years. I do apologize. Uh, and to watch Sudharsana's students dance, I mean, gosh, it really was, it was memorizing. And you could, again, imagine how the, the convergence of traditional cultural practices and traditional religious practices creates that bonding experience, that sense of community, that social glue that binds these people together in a world full of folks who might not otherwise understand what the heck they're doing or what's going on. Ah, so this is an image from the Sikh temple. Uh, this is just a woman making bread. 
which is a very simple thing to do, right? Women have been making bread for thousands and thousands of years. But again, these folks, many of them first or second generation immigrants coming from the Punjab, either modern day India or some of them Pakistan, coming all the way, the thousands of miles to here where you know, people make different types of bread. You can't find traditional Punjabi cooking you know, at McDonald's or at, you know, at Starbucks. So this woman, you know, older woman, you could probably imagine that she learned this, this recipe that she's making when she was a young girl. Um, perhaps when she was back in India herself, learning this recipe. And now she's continuing to make it, she's passing it on to the other folks um, in this, in this uh, organization. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty fundamental thing, right? The recipes of our childhood, the recipes that we recognize and identify with uh, would be very, very important. Now, this particular event she's, she's preparing the food for, it's called langar. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but just keep in mind that uh, langar is pretty cool and it's free and it's open to the public. You could go there too. Next up. Um, at the Muslim Community Center, I was very taken by the calligraphy, the tile art that was on display throughout the, uh, throughout the, the mosque. Um, and this was just one image that I, that I really liked of that tile art. Again, the, the delicate strokes, the elegance of the, uh, the, the, um, the, the language, right, Arabic language on display there. Um, especially in to my knowledge, most all uh, Muslim traditions, you're really not supposed to have graven images of people or prophets or things like that. So the tile work, the, the, the written language, uh, so beautifully written, stands in for a lot of places where you know, Christians might use stained glass or they might use kind of pictorial icon iconographic representations. And even that's been kind of controversial in Christian history, right? But this is some, um, some calligraphy from the, the mosque. And finally, at the Unitarian Society, pretty much every one of their services, every one of their meetings, they would have music involved somehow, right? Now, this gentleman just playing, uh, what is that? Is that a ukulele? What is that? Do you guys know what this instrument is? It's a small guitar. It's a small little guitar, and he's playing it. And again, it's just like a fun little thing to liven up the, uh, the service, to, to, to liven up the, uh, the, the, the meeting. Um, and they, they make a point to do it every single meeting, whether it's this guy playing his ukulele-like thing, or they had other, of course, artists playing other things. And I don't know that this gentleman is playing the songs of his people from a faraway land. Uh, it could just be a guy playing the guitar, but nonetheless, it doesn't have to be anything more than that, right? Um, it can just be a simple human moment with a guitar. The next theme. The next theme is family. And gosh, what could be more important than that? And I probably don't have to tell you how family is one of the main vehicles through which religious traditions are, are passed down, are disseminated, right? And, you know, the way I see it, I think that's one of the strongest reasons that religions persist through time is because, well, people are just doing what, more or less, what their parents taught them, what their grandparents taught their parents, their great-grandparents taught their... I mean, there's this transmission. Again, a, a social aspect of having a place in time belonging to something larger and greater than just yourself that persists well back for time immemorial. And family is the, the main vehicle for that transmission. This is a gentleman named Kamal Deep Singh. And by the way, in the, the Sikh tradition, uh, all men have that, that last name Singh. I think it means lion. And oh gosh, um, the women have something that translates to, to flower. I want to say flower. I've, I guess I've forgotten what that is. I, I apologize. But Kamal Deep Singh. Um, you can see him there with his son. He actually had three kids on display, but I think I got the best picture of him with his, his youngest right there. So it is important to me that my children know where they come from and the traditions they've inherited. If they choose not to follow them, so be it. But I want them to have the knowledge first. And I think for many parents in a religious setting, that kind of transmission is incredibly important. Again, if the kids choose to go their own path, uh, yeah, as Kamal says, so be it. But passing on that knowledge is, is so important to a lot of people. And it was important to Kamal as well. Kamal was really my... Uh, you know, my envoy to the, to the Sikh community. He would meet me at the door pretty much every time that I came there. He was a really, really easy to work with, really nice and welcoming guy. So here you can see back at the, uh, at the, the Hindu temple, 
uh, you can see that very clear transmission of the practice of worship, right? I assume grandma to grandkid, I could be wrong, you know, I don't know their exact relation. But, you know, I mean, this could be just as much, uh, a, a, you know, someone teaching their kid how to hit a baseball on, on a tee, right? This, this very uh, formative experience for the young girl, she's learning the moves, the form, maybe later in her life she'll understand the significance behind what she's doing, but it starts from a very young age, just like this. And here you can see, this is at the Sikh temple, and um, the adults are in the room there with the red carpeting. That's where they are actively in the process of praying, a communal kind of prayer session. Um, and you can see the kids who really don't know entirely what's going on. You know, they haven't really been initiated into the greater significance of what's going on inside, still too young. They're outside, and you can see the, the older daughters taking care of the, the younger son, and of course... That's mom's watchful eye in the back there. She's still keeping an eye on the kids. So for these folks, I could imagine, again, this, this young formative experience of these, these young kids here in the, uh, uh, in the picture, that, again, this, this temple is not just a place where they come and they worship and they pray. It's also a place, you know, where this family helps to raise itself, where these kids help to, you know, bring each other up. And, of course, mom does as, as well. This is an image from the, the mosque, the Islamic Center. And again, all the men who kind of know the drill, they know the ropes, they're off in a line, all you know, lined up next to each other, praying together. Again, very egalitarian in that sense. Um, and then there's the little kid who doesn't really quite get it yet. You can see he doesn't know where to put his feet. He doesn't really know how to line up. He's still watching. He's still learning. This will be an experience that will become ingrained into his brain. He'll know, he'll learn. So that by the time he's as old as his brothers or his father's up there, whomever that might be, he really kind of would get the picture, right? He is, he's, he's taught from a young age how to do this. And then maybe when he's older, he'll know the why. He'll know the greater significance behind it. And then finally, from the Unitarian Universalist Society, these, uh, these two kids participating in uh, just a little uh, uh, a fire ceremony. At the beginning of their, their session, they light this little fire in the center of the, uh, the, the, uh, the space. And then at the end of the session, they extinguish it. They snuff it out. And in this particular instance, these two kids uh, were invited to come and to do that. Right? So, they're, so they're learning the tradition as well. Again, even though Unitarianism is not quite so dogmatic as the other traditions that we're looking at, there's no set form or function to how a service is supposed to go, these kids are still here, kind of learning, inculcated in this experience, so that maybe when they become older, they'll remember this and they'll take themselves or their families when they're ready to back to the Unitarian uh, temple, or the society, rather. Temple wouldn't be the right word. And then finally, our, our final part, uh, our final theme, rather, uh, giving back or charity, you know? And, and this is something that you can observe in pretty much every organized religious tradition uh, throughout history, right? I mean, it's, it's so central to what religions do. Um, religions often served as the social services, the social safety net in a time before municipal or government safety nets ever even existed, right? Before governments were powerful enough to be able to provide these, these functions, religious groups did, you know, and we can, I could talk to you all day about how this would, would take place in Schenectady, right, in the 1600s, how the Dutch church was the main source of alms, and how there was a poor pasture run by the Dutch church uh, that would support people who could not support themselves, who didn't have land or the means to support themselves, so giving back. And I don't know why this picture looks so grainy. I, I swear the original picture looked a lot better. It's, the file got corrupted when I was putting it on this PowerPoint. I don't know. The, I, I'm sorry, Lois. Your picture, the picture that we hung on the wall looked better than that, I promise. Uh, so this was Lois Porter. She's from the Unitarian Society. Uh, and this is just a quote when I was speaking uh, with her that you know, I was sure to jot down. Love is the spirit of this church and service is our prayer. Service is our prayer. For her, the act of giving back to someone else is just as important as any invocation to any deity she could ever possibly make. Service is our prayer. So, this is an image uh, from a 5K, a 5K, which was organized by the Hindu Temple Group. They organized this in Colony Crossings Park. 
Uh, everyone lined up. Everyone was, you know, they sponsored. They raised money to take uh, part in this, uh, this, this race. And then they were off. And you can see them all going. Quite a lot of people involved in this race. A lot of money being raised. I forget what the exact cause was for. That was back in the day. But you can see, again, everyone coming together to raise money for this, for this cause. Next up, in the Sikh temple, this is that langar I was talking about. Every Sunday, the Sikhs open up their, their, their temple to the community, and you can go there for a free lunch. They do this everywhere there is the, the Khalsa, the, the Sikh community exists. They offer this to the community. They do it back in Amritsar, in the Punjab. They're you know, kind of the center of their religion. Anywhere there are Sikhs, they, they do this. Um, and a lot of folks back in India, you know, folks who might be living in poverty, rely on the local Sikh community uh, for this, this meal. You know, once a week, they know they have a place to go and they have a place to eat, right? So the way it works is everyone sits down, again, right next to each other on these long, uh, these rugs that they roll out. And, well, the, uh, um, the, the women kind of go through, and they'd been cooking all day, right? That other woman that I had showed you, baking that bread or rolling that dough, she had been preparing for this uh, pretty much all day. And they go around, and they serve you. They served me. I was just, you know, before I was taking this picture, I was sitting on that rug, and they came by, and they just gave me all the free food that I could ever ask for. They kept on giving me more, too. They're like, oh, here, take this. Oh, take this. And, you know, I'm not intimately familiar with the, the Punjabi food, right? There's, there's Indian food that you can get at, like, a restaurant bite, right? But that's obviously an oversimplification. Uh, and they give it to you, again, hand to hand, right? I think that's kind of striking about it. Hand to hand. What can be more human? What can be a more powerful connection than receiving your daily bread straight from the hands of another person? And again, you can imagine the type of bond, the type of community that that creates between these folks. So it's a pretty powerful scene. And again, it's open to everyone. You can go there in five days if you want to. Ah, so this was from the, uh, the Muslim Community Center, the Islamic Community Center. And central to the Muslim faith is zakat, the practice of giving back to the, to the community, right? Uh, you are a very little standing in your local community if you cannot, well, rather, if you, if you choose not to give back. If you are not a very wealthy person and you can't, you, you don't have anything to, to give back, uh, well, obviously, you're not kind of penalized for it. But those who can are expected to give. It is a matter of faith, an article of faith uh, in Islam that you give back. And then finally, at the Unitarian Church, um, again, drawing from many traditions, as they do, uh, these folks decided to create um, uh, a wreath of cranes, which, of course, draws its tradition from Japan, right? This is Japanese origami, and there's this uh, tradition in Japan of creating these, uh, you know, these, these flights of wreaths, all, uh, sorry, these flights of, of cranes, all strung up together. Um, and they also, like, so they... They would make these cranes, but it was also in the, the service of raising money. Um, I believe it was for a local hospital. So this was all part of a fundraising effort. You know, each crane would be sponsored with a sum of money. So for each crane, there was money donated to this cause. And I just thought, again, you can see that uh, across these four cultures, these four traditions, rather. And that kind of brings me uh, to the end here, folks. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments about anything that I just said? And I mean, here we are. This is a religious group. Can you guys see any parallels or similarities to how you guys practice here at the Niski Una Reformed Church? Is this making sense to you guys? How so? I mean, what, what do you guys do? I'm sure you guys have community fundraising events, right? What do you guys do in that respect? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, we're, we have a very active mission and service group. I'm and sure. And we serve lunches at the Salvation Army. We um, serve, help serve dinners at the um, city mission. Mm -hmm. And we make collections and, and do, there's going to be a lunch program with children over the summer mm -hmm. in the pocket parks all throughout um, Schenectady. So we're, we're pretty active. Very cool, very cool. Yeah. And again, you guys don't have to justify any of that to me. I, I, I believe you guys. I mean, I, um, 
Uh, this isn't like an audit of your charitable giving. I'm not with the IRS. Uh, but no, so I guess when we kind of get to the end of it, what does this all mean, right? What, what does this all mean? Uh, and what I was hoping to achieve with this presentation, with this exhibit back in 2016, again, you have all this kind of suspicion and otherness surrounding different religious traditions. Again, when, when I was talking to, to the Islamic folks in the, in, in the mosque, they were very wary of me coming in there with a camera. Um, the Sikhs, when I visited with them, they, they recounted there was an incident, I think was it in, gosh, it was like right after 9-11 that some random Sikh guy got murdered by just some random jerk because while well, Sikhs all wear turbans, that's an article of faith as well, and just ignorant Americans associate turbans with Islam, with Osama bin Laden, with, with terrorism, blah, 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 so they, they killed this poor Sikh guy just he wasn't even Muslim, and it wouldn't even be fair if he was Muslim either, right? This was obviously just several levels of absurdity, um, and so they recounted that. And, and when it comes right down to it, you know, as more new and different peoples come to this area, we might be shocked and maybe even intimidated by the apparent differences on display. The, the form of this religious practice might look wildly different than what we're used to, but folks, I would encourage you to consider, and maybe you already know this, but I would encourage you to consider nonetheless that the function is all still the same. The kind of the core social and human aspects to how these religious traditions are organized are, are fundamentally the same across these different traditions, across different Christian and Jewish traditions, any tradition, I think you'll find very much the same core practices. Maybe the beliefs are different, right? This metaphysical stuff, this epistemological stuff. Maybe that might be different, but when it comes down to the everyday practice of religion, I think you'll find some very core human similarities to all that stuff. So I guess when it comes down to it, you know, the people in whom we trust can look like anything. They can believe anything so long as we recognize that shared humanity amongst us all. And I guess that's the concluding thought for this presentation. Any question? Yes, ma'am. I wondered uh, if you had been back to any of those congregations and joined them again. You know, I really haven't. Um, and I really should have done, too, you know, uh, because they were all super welcoming. And, you know, it, the only reason that I really stopped going is because I be got busy with other, like, life things, you know. Uh, uh, even when I, this was before I was employed with the Historical Society, so I had a whole bunch of other weird jobs that I was working. And I guess by the time that I was employed by the Historical Society, I had felt that like the kind of, maybe I'd lost my connection or whatever, it'd be kind of weird or random for me to show up. But you're absolutely right, I should follow up with these folks. You know, they were super welcoming to me when I was a complete and total stranger, and now that I'm kind of somewhat a stranger, maybe they remember me, maybe they don't. I'm sure they'd welcome me all the same. So I should really go back and, and see how they're doing. Not that they need me to, to check on them, right? But, but still, <laughs> that's a great point. Yes, sir. You want to uh, no, I just, um, I was curious how um, your opinion of some of these re religions changed after actually taking part in some of these ceremonies. How, how has it changed your opinion of, uh, regarding Sikhs and Muslims? Mm -hmm. Hindus, how has it changed your opinion of these different groups by, by going there and witnessing some sure. of the traditions? I mean, that's a great tradition. Uh, that's a great question. And obviously, I was born morally perfect, so my opinion didn't change. Uh, no, 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 that's not the case. But so I went to, to Hamilton College where, you know, you are kind of exposed to a lot of different uh, peoples, a lot of different traditions. Uh, so it was kind of inculcated wi within me, not through any moral virtue of my own, but just even as a, as a matter of kind of social conformity, that yes, every tradition should be respected. Every tradition has merit and, and worth and value. And in my, my studies, you know, I, I studied a lot of world religions, so I was able to kind of gain an appreciation for at least what these things were on paper, you know, kind of what they believed on paper. Um, but I guess the way that my opinion changed is that 
my understand not, not my opinion, but my understanding of these traditions changed immensely. Because things that I read about in the books, they look very different when people are actually doing them, right? And that can be for a variety of reasons. So I don't know that I changed my opinion about these peoples, but but definitely my understanding of them. I I, I I feel like I grew to have a deeper and, and, and a better understanding of them. I felt slightly less ignorant about the world around me. And again, my, my own community, right? These folks, they're our neighbors, right? Whether we see them on a daily basis or not, they are living here. Um, they are worshiping here. So, you know, we really ought to at least try to make a, an effort to, to, to understand them. So, I, obviously, I haven't I, I could go back. I should do more to, to better understand. But uh, I, I took one step, one step on a lifelong journey of, of, of better understanding, perhaps. Any other questions? Any other, any other questions? All right, folks. Well, if you do have any questions or comments or anything, you can always forward them through Leo, or I'm sure, Leo, you can pass out my contact information. Uh, feel free uh, to do so. Uh, but it's been a real pleasure speaking with you all. Um, again, this exhibit is no longer hanging up at the Schenectady County Historical Society, but we always have more exhibits on display, other things that you can explore and learn about your local area. So we really hope to see you guys come on in for some of our exhibits or our walking tours or our special programs. There's always more to learn about our local community here. So thank you so much, and I'll start packing up. Have a nice day.